Hey there, internet. Today we're going to talk about gears. We're going to talk about how difficult it is to make gears. And it really isn't easy, particularly if you're trying to make small gears. The problem with small gears on a CNC machine is that the radius of the cutter gets so small, it's impossible to make the profile. So there's a bunch of techniques. The main techniques are to use a gear shaper, to use a gear hob, and then there's also ways to do it with a regular shaper or finally with a gear cutter. So if you happen to have a shaper, you can do the gear cutting. So I've actually, I've, I've discovered some ways where you can use a regular CNC machine to make a gear, but uh, you need a fourth axis and you need to write some custom G code. Now this works, but it's pretty slow for large gears. The other method that's interesting is using a gear shaper, but uh, as you can see, these machines are ridiculously expensive. Uh, this one actually looks like a pretty good price, but who knows if it works. It's not only expensive for the machine, it's expensive for the tooling. And this thing probably weighs 20,000 pounds, which most people can't afford to have in their own home shop. So it would seem that one of the most practical ways to make gears that is both accurate as well as not painfully slow is to use uh, a gear hob. Now, Andy's machines on YouTube has made some really amazing documentation of how to go about making your own gear hob and controller. Now, this is Andy's machine. Uh, he goes into great detail about how to make this. He goes into also detail around how he configured the controller and, and all of those sorts of things. And while I think Andy's machine is wonderful, uh, I uh, wanted to do my own thing. And so this video is going to be about my journey to doing something very similar to this, uh, but using an ESP32 microcontroller. Now, it's important to note that uh, this isn't necessarily the best way to do things, and this is the absolute bare minimum of what you can do here. There's a whole bunch of additional features that I could add to the one that I made. This got me up and running. It's allowing me to cut some gears, but it definitely could use some improvements. So, so stick around if you're interested in this topic, and we'll get started right now to talk about the basics of the machine that I built. Here's the basic schematic. First, we've got an encoder, then we've got the spindle, this might be whatever kind of spindle you want it to be. In my case, it's a jet milling machine. And we've got the actual hob itself, which is connected to the spindle. We've got some way to index it, meaning to, to rotate the part in relation to the spindle. We've got some kind of a motor. We've got a motor controller. Could be a stepper, could be a servo. And we've got a microcontroller. Now, the only thing the microcontroller needs to know about is the encoder and the stepper controller. Everything else in the system is not really relevant for the process of hobbing a gear. So the pieces of the program are pretty basic. The first thing is an IDE. I prefer Visual Studio Code. You could absolutely do this with the Arduino Studio or one of those other IDEs, but VS Code is kind of the gold standard. And uh, using that with Platform IO is something I would highly recommend. So there may be a bit of a learning curve for you. There's a ton of tutorials out there but I would definitely invest in learning how to use Visual Studio with the Platform IO plugin because that'll let you use a whole bunch of stuff if you want to use a STM32 controller or if you want to use pretty much anything else, uh, that's the way to go. The next thing you have to do is pick a stepper library. I picked Fast Excel Stepper for a number of reasons. The main reason is that it has acceleration, number one. Number two, it supports the ESP32 R, uh, RTM peripheral. Number three, it allows very fine grain control. The encoder, uh, this is just a basic quadrature encoder. This is something, some code that I that I cobbled together. This is pretty easy to, to use. You could use a library here, but uh, you know it's not that complicated. You need some kind of ability to use an async timer. You don't want to have any blocking code. I've been using a timer called NeoTimer for a long time. I just remember how it works. I don't have to read the documentation is really the only reason I use it. It works good enough. And then finally, for the most bare bones implementation, you need some way to, to reconfigure the number of teeth or some of the other parameters. There's really only three parameters that are configurable. Uh, the library I'm using is called serial config command and it's pretty straightforward to use. So the specifics of my system, I've made a couple choices. Now you can do whatever you want, but I chose ESP32 for the microprocessor. There's a bunch of reasons, but the main reasons are that it has uh, two cores. It's pretty fast. It has an RMT peripheral, which can be used for generating the step pulses. This completely offloads that from uh, the CPU. It's got Wi-Fi and Bluetooth peripherals so that you can connect to it over your network or uh, you can make an app for it. 
So the ESP32 is super versatile and uh, it works pretty well for this type of thing and I'm pretty familiar with it. The next decision is about the motor and I decided to use a servo which is a 180 watt servo by Stepper Online. You could totally use a stepper but the steppers have some issues uh, with respect to the acceleration curve. So the faster the stepper goes, the lower the torque for the stepper is. And at high speeds, a stepper basically has almost zero torque. Now, because my indexer has a 40 to one ratio for the input to the output, I need a pretty high speed. It has an integrated controller, which is super nice. So all I have to do is feed two signals, a step and a direction signal and uh, it has an integrated thousand count encoder which means i get pretty ridiculous resolution for this kind of application for me the servo was the best choice so what does the program look like in its most basic form the program flow is really basic right you, you've got a setup routine it sets up all it sets up your encoder it sets up the stepper library it configures all the pins uh, and then you enter a run state a run or a main state that just loops forever so the next thing uh, th that you do is you wait for an encoder interrupt. It does a couple other things, but I'm not gonna detail all those. Uh, you, wait, you get an encoder interrupt. Uh, the encoder then does things like check, checks the direction. If things have moved, it's gonna enter this simple function here. This is where all the magic happens. Uh, the basic calculation here is you have some factor. The factor is calculated by your machine configuration. In my case, the servo has to spin 40 times for the part to spin one time. And the factor is a floating point representation of that ratio. So you take that times the pulse count of the encoder. And if the stepper calculated pulse position is larger than the current position, then we issue a move command to the stepper uh, to move to the calculated stepper position. So this is almost like a PID controller but the stepper library is doing all that managing all the acceleration uh, this doesn't have any overshoot in it uh, there's no tuning required once that set point position gets sent it asynchronously tells the stepper library hey this is where you want to be that all that happens asynchronously and then it goes back into the uh, the normal run state now everything i just described is not exactly correct because interrupts don't really actually run in the run state but th this this general flow is essentially how the system works. Here's the schematic. I've got a encoder pin, a four pin header for the two encoder pins, the five volt signal on the ground. Over here I've got, uh, I can do a three or a four pin header. These are all connected to the same wires. I'm not using the fault signal. So it's really only stepped or and ground for my servo controller. Down here, I've just got a couple resistors and a couple LEDs. Uh, this just lets me do SMD or through hole, depending on how much work I want to do as far as soldering. Then down here, we can have a 24 volt input that goes into a LDO to convert the 24 volts down to five volts to power the microcontroller. And this is what the board looks like. This can be a single sided PCB. There's no bodge wires or anything required. No. Uh, no layer two components at all. Let's talk about some of the caveats to the really basic version of this. All right, here's the controller. Basically, I have the step and dir output going to the servo, and this is my encoder signal. There's no LDO on the board, so it's currently taking power from the laptop. Here's the wiring for the servo. And then up here, you can see the encoder. I've got a one-to-one -one gear. These are some uh, helical gears I made with my other technique uh, on the CNC machine. The biggest problem with this is that the encoder is in the way. If I want to get the wrench onto the draw bar, this is on the way. So what I want to do here is actually make a, a quick release or a quick removal mount for this thing. This gear is bolted to the, to the spline carrier I don't want to actually move it, but this for the the spindle freely moves up and down, and I, I just had to machine some features onto this to attach this uh, this helical gear here. So if I manually turn the spindle, you can see the servo is cranking on the uh, the dividing head there very slowly. If I turn the spindle on. You can see that speed increases quite a lot. Now, if you're doing a really small gear, this speed, this, the speed of this 
gets very, very high, which is kind of an issue. And I'm not exactly sure where that lag comes from. So this is another potential issue. If I increase the, if I increase the RPMs to 1,000, now the run set at 1,000 RPMs. There's everything moving along. You can see uh, the servo is chugging along pretty good there. We look down here at a lag number, we're about 200 steps. So the number of steps per revolution, the, the servo has to drive 64,000 steps for one single revolution of the part. So the faster that it has to spin, obviously, the more uh, lag there might be between the encoder and the encoder processing and the interrupts and all that kind of stuff. The other issue that you might notice is that the, the spindle really should be clocked. So because these teeth are slanted, in order to get them to cut parallel, this spindle should rotate three degrees. You might think that you could just rotate this, but unfortunately because this traverses uh, in relation to the spindle, it, that doesn't nullify the effect of the helical angle on the cutter. This is just a tap, but it happens to work out to be almost exactly a 0.5 module metric gear. So over here, this is where I was parting off the gear stock. You can see that there's a helical on this gear. Now I'm only making, you know, two, two millimeter gears here. Uh, so that, that, that small of a distance in the helical isn't really going to make a huge impact for this particular application. If I was making a real high precision gear, I'd have to uh, angle the spindle, cut the gear, and then retram it every time I want to use this thing which is in fact kind of a pain in the ass. The final issue is the fact that I have to have the laptop powering the thing and then I have to enter the data into the thing uh, with the laptop connected. So it's kind of a pain in the ass. Like I don't want to have my laptop close to the machine because the speakers pick up chips and it ruins the sound on the speakers and it's just bad for the laptop. So I want to get some Wi-Fi capabilities that's something I plan to do in the future. Well, that's it. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, leave them down below. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up or subscribe. That would be super appreciated. And hopefully I've helped somebody out who's trying to make a gear hopper.